audio lecture, The New Imperialism, from 1880 to 1914. This is one of the lectures that is going to really lead us into World War I. Key concept. So first of all, what is imperialism? Basic definition is the control of one people by another. It can be political imperialism, economic imperialism, or cultural imperialism. Sometimes it's a combination of all three. The old wave of imperialism was what happened between the 16th to 18th centuries. Now, European powers did not usually acquire large amounts of territory in Africa and Asia during this period, but instead built a series of trade stations along the coastline. The New World was the exception in this time period. 16th century Portuguese and Spanish trade routes, you might recognize these from earlier this year. European migration is also a part of this new wave of imperialism. Between 1815 and 1932, over 60 million people left Europe. Great Britain, Ireland, Italy, and Germany saw the largest number of immigrants, meaning leaving, E means leaving, exiting, um, immigrants leave their homelands. Migrants went primarily to European inhabited areas, North and South America, of course, Australia, New Zealand, and Siberia. European migration provided a further impetus or uh, catalyst for Western expansion to happen in this time period, the new wave of imperialism. Most immigrants were poor and from rural, rural areas, though seldom from the poorest classes due to oppressive land policies in the home country. Jewish immigrants who went to the U.S. in large numbers were the least likely to return to their homelands due to the persecution of Jews in Eastern Europe that we know was going on throughout the 19th century, the pogroms in Russia in particular. Concept. Concept. So, new imperialism. It began in the 1880s in Africa. It really was a little earlier when you look at Asia. In 1800, Europeans controlled about 7% of the world's territory, but by 1914, Europeans controlled about 84% of the world's territory. It's a huge amount of colonization that happened in that century. The British Empire controlled about 25% of the world's population by 1900 and somewhere between 20 to 25% of the world's territory by that same date. The old saying goes, the empire upon which the sun never sets. Key concept. Europeans colonized Africa and Asia by using military force to take control over local governments by, uh, and exploiting local economies for raw materials required by Europe's growing industry and imposing Western values to benefit the backwards, quote unquote, colonies. These are the basic motivations for this new wave of imperialism. Most of it really was driven by the new industry at home. Industrialization requ um, required raw materials for it to keep working, and uh, these nations needed access to these raw materials. The superiority of European weaponry included armed steamships that could penetrate Africa going upriver into the African interior. They also had muskets with bullets. Even now, breech-loading rifles, machine guns, and quinine, a drug that protected susceptible Europeans from malaria. These were all tools that the Europeans would use to penetrate the African continent. Key concept. Key concept. Key concept. 
So let's talk about the major causes for this imperialist impulse, this new wave of imperialism. First of all, of course, the search for new markets and raw materials. The Industrial Revolution created a surplus of goods and capitalists sought new markets to sell those goods in. The new markets proved elusive, however, as colonial peoples were too poor to purchase the European goods. But the raw materials, having access to raw materials from these places, that did pay off. Raw materials like ivory and rubber in the Congo region, diamonds in South Africa, cocoa in Niger, tea in China and Ceylon or Sri Lanka, cotton from India, and spices from Indonesia. Key concept. Missionary work was also part of the new wave of imperialism, much like it was with old imperialism in the 16th through 18th centuries. A strong current of religious revivalism happened in the mid 19th century all throughout Western Europe. Particularly strong it was among the middle class. There was a new emphasis on spreading Christianity now to Africa and Asia to the, quote, heathens that they said were living there. Missionary activities proved far more successful in sub-Saharan Africa than in Asia, however, um, and was also better there than in the Islamic part of North Africa. Dr. David Livingston was the first white man to do humanitarian and religious work in South and Central Africa. Joseph Stanley found Livingston, whom Westerners thought to be dead. They stopped getting messages for, from him. After several years, H.M. Stanley um, and his new newspaper reports created European interest in Africa. Stanley sought aid of the King of Belgium to dominate the Congo region. Stanley told the King of Belgium that there was money that could be made here, that there were raw materials that were ripe for the taking in this Congo region. And eventually, the King of Belgium took him up on this, King Leopold of Belgium, and will exploit the area um, as much as he possibly can. We'll talk more about that as we go through these later slides. Military and naval bases were built to protect a country's imperial interests against other European powers. It became a land grab between nations. Britain was concerned by French and German land grabs in the 1880s, so they were more willing to send their troops down to protect their interests in Africa and in Asia. These countries might seal off their empires with high tariffs and restrictions. Future economic opportunities might be lost forever. So this is why it was imperative to protect these regions, their interests in these regions. And as you can probably guess, uh, nations fighting each other over spheres of influence, meaning territories that they wanted to take, was just one step away from them fighting each other outright in World War I. So imperialism will be one of the major causes leading to the Great War. Increased tensions emerged between the have nations like the British Empire and the have not nations like Germany and Italy who came in late to the imperialistic competition. And if you think about it, it makes sense that Germany and Italy were late to the imperialism land grab because they had not really formed as nations until the 1860s and 1870s, um, 1860s for Italy, 1870s for Germany. So that meant that they were late to the game and they will be acting very aggressively to try to catch up to the other nations who had already started taking the prime pieces of real estate with the resources in Africa and Asia. So an aggressive Germany in particular um, in these areas is going to be um, a factor, if you will, leading up to World War I eventually. There's also, we have to talk about another cause, meaning the ideology of nationalism coupled with social Darwinism. Now, we've been talking about nationalism 
for several units. Social Darwinism you were introduced to in the last unit as well. Um, this whole idea that comes from Darwinism himself was the survival of the fittest. Herbert Spencer is the one who utilized this survival of the fittest ideology to rationalize the conquest of weak countries by stronger ones, stronger, more civilized ones, he would argue. Ultimately saying, if the stronger countries, because they have the technology to do so, can come in and take over an area, that means that they must be more fit to rule that area than the native populations that were conquered. It justified military superiority and conquest by the Europeans. We also have um, The White Man's Burden. Um, it was a poem, actually, that was written by Rudyard Kipling that ultimately uh, became sort of the justification for imperialism. Um, this concept, White Man's Burden, basically was a racist and patronizing view of imperialism that preached that the superior Westerners had an obligation to bring their culture to uncivilized people in other parts of the world. It smacks of racism and paternalism. Um, it also uh, sought to protect and improve the lives of non-Europeans, supposedly, but that is really not the major push here. Really, it's control so they can exploit the resources of the region. The, this phrase, like I said, was coined by Royud Kipling in his poem by the same name, which is one of the sources that you're going to be reading in your um, document packet uh, to do for your DBQ analysis chart for this unit. Here's the white man's burden. Take up just part of it. Take up the white man's burden, and the word burden meaning duty. Take up the white man's burden. Send forth the best ye breed. Go bind your sons to exile to serve your captives' need. To wait in heavy harness on fluttered folk and wild. Your new-caught sullen peoples, half devil and half child. As you can see, he's basically saying it was the white man's, quote, duty to go and conquer these areas. Because after all, they are better than the people that they're conquering. Look, he calls them half devil and half child. Um, very racist, very paternalistic, basically saying we're delivering civilization to these people, but in reality, they're not. In reality, they're taking over and exploiting these people and these territories. Disney and Russia especially used imperialistic drive to divert popular attention at home from the class struggles that were going on and to create a false sense of national unity. So, we've been talking a little bit about how this happened mostly in Africa and Asia with this new wave of imperialism. So let's first start with Africa, which sometimes is referred to as the scramble for Africa, meaning the nations in Europe scrambling to gain territory in Africa and outdo one another um, while gaining control of those areas for uh, resources that they can use in their industries, as well as what they hope new markets to outdo one another um, at home in Europe, too. In 1880, Europeans controlled, as I said before, uh, smaller areas. 10% uh, of Africa was only controlled, and that was mostly on the coastline before 1880. By 1914, Europeans controlled the entire continent except for Liberia and Ethiopia, those two small areas. Penetration into the interior of Africa began in the late 1870s when Belgium took control over the Congo region. Britain's conquest of Egypt in the early 1880s became the quote, model for the new imperialism. The Berlin Conference in 1884 in 85, established the rules among the European powers for carving up Africa. It basically was a meeting, a summit meeting held with world leaders from all over Europe, and basically a big map of Europe, I'm sorry, a big map of Africa, and they each were 
um, stating which areas they would claim. No body from Africa was invited to these to this conference. The local populations were not even considered. So again, it smacks of racism and paternalism and European quote you know feelings of superiority over these peoples. Congo became a colony of Belgium, like I said. It eventually was called the Belgian Congo. In 1879, at the behest of Leopold II, the British American journal, journalist named H.M. Stanley established trading stations in the Congo for Belgium and signed um, specious treaties with African chiefs that gave Leopold himself control over the Congo. 1884-1885, the Berlin Conference recognized the region as the Congo Free State and as Leopold's personal possession. Do you understand that? Leopold, King Leopold of Belgium's personal possession would be the Congo region. The Belgian leaders savagely treated the indigenous peoples in their quest for rubber and ivory. Rubber was a raw material that they could get there. Um, which we needed more and more of once, you know, automobiles and those kinds of things were being built. And ivory, of course, also being um, a, a resource. The Belgian parliament was horrified by the revelations of atrocities in the Congo and took the, the personal colony away from King Leopold, finally, in 1908. But they didn't give it back to the Belgian people. They made it a Belgian colony a state colony, not just the personal possession of the king any longer. Perhaps half of the Congo's population had died by 1908 when this was done due to the treatment of Leopold's um, men uh, and trying to gain access to the raw materials in the Congo region. In the photos here on the right, you see Congolese children and wives whose fathers failed to meet rubber collection quotas. When that happened, the family members were punished by having their hands cut off. In other words, if the dad does not harvest enough rubber, the required amount that you know is given to him on his quota, they would cut off the hands of his children or his wife, not his hands because he needs his hands for work, to basically punish him for not doing enough. The threat would sometimes be enough, but oftentimes, as you can see, many, many millions of people were maimed. Awful treatment. Awful. This is a 1906 Punch cartoon. Punch, remember, is that British magazine depicting King Leopold II as a rubber vine entangling a Congolese man. As you can see, the rubber vine looks like a snake strangling the Congolese man, of course, gaining, you know, of course, showing Leopold taking over and, and um, taking everything from the Congolese people and the treatment of these people. Horrible. Of course, the name of this cartoon was In the Rubber Coils. Britain's control of Egypt in 1883 became the model for the new imperialism, however. Uh, the Tur there was a Turkish general named Muhammad Ali, no, not the boxer, <laughs> uh, but he had made Egypt into a strong and virtually independent state by 1849. Egypt's inability, however, to satisfy foreign investors led to control of its finances by France and Britain. The mismanagement of the finances by the by um, Ali and his successors basically got him into debt to France and Britain. In 1875, Britain bought a significant portion of shares for the Suez Canal since um, they since the king was so indebted to them, he, they were able to purchase this huge section of land. Um, and of course, the digging of the Suez Canal um, happened. Uh, the British began managing the Suez Canal, meaning it was no longer a possession of um, the King of Egypt. 
Instead, it belonged to the British by 1875. Here's the Suez Canal, which of course will connect, will make it a lot easier for Great Britain to get to um, their other territories in India without having to go all the way around the tip of Africa. In 1883, Britain declared Egypt a protectorate of theirs setting the stage for similar practices by other European nations. Now, get this, y'all. Britain declares Egypt a protectorate, saying that Egypt is now under their protection. In reality, Egypt now belongs to Great Britain. Protection, quote unquote, of the Suez Canal was the key motive in the British occupation of Egypt and its bloody conquest eventually of the Sudan region. Britain claimed the protectorate would only be temporary, but of course it was not. Technically, Egypt was still part of the Ottoman Empire, but Britain actually controlled the country. Egypt remained a protectorate of Great Britain from 1883 until 1956. And this is another political cartoon showing how many fingers the British had in other territories. It's called The Devil Fish in Egyptian Waters. It's an 1882 American cartoon commenting on Britain's takeover of Egypt and her control over other territories throughout the world. You can see them labeled all throughout the world, got their hands and everything. The face of that represents England actually was a real person. There's a British imperialist named Cecil Rhodes. He had actually taken over a central um, African region um, called, that he named Rhodesia. It's a place that uh, where a lot of diamonds came from. Key concept. Key concept. The Berlin Conference happened in 1884 to 1885. This was done was called by Bismarck um, to try to keep the European nations from going to war with each other, fighting over the territories in Africa. Instead, it, the hopes were that they could establish, quote, the rules for conquest of Africa. Provisions. No imperial power could claim a territory in Africa unless it effectively already controlled that territory. In other words, they had to be on the ground, have men on the ground there and in control of the colony before they could claim it as the, a territory for their home nation. They couldn't just say, oh, I'm going to want that piece right there um, on a map without actually being there, having people on the ground there already. Slavery and the slave trade in Africa would be terminated, however, it was outlawed. It sought to prevent international conflicts, like I said, between European nations over the issue of imperialism, but ultimately it just kicked the can down the road a little bit. There will eventually be conflicts between nations who are fighting over territories or spheres of influence, one of the causes leading up to World War I. So, as I said, the Berlin Conference was sponsored by the German Chancellor, Otto von Bismarck, as well as Jules Ferry from France. They sought to prevent conflict over imperialism. That was the initial intention, remember. The Congress uh, coincided with Germany's rise as an imperial power as well, and its desire to play Britain and France off of each other. Britain and France, who normally hated each other, had a hate-hate relationship. So it was a way for Germany to get their feet in the water since they were a newer nation, maybe be able to claim some territories and play Britain and France off of each other. As a result, the scramble for Africa was on. By 1914, all but those two African countries had been conquered. Again, Ethiopia and Liberia. Ethiopia was attempted to be taken over by the Italians. Uh, they failed. Ethiopia would be able to um, fight back and, and keep Italy from being able to take the territory. Uh, and that will be the case until right before World War II. Uh, Liberia was a, an independent state that had been founded by freed slaves from the United States. 
um, and they uh, founded this new territory called Liberia. So here you will see that all but those, um, let's see, Liberia, all but the gray, the Ethiopia over on the right in the um, eastern part of Africa, and Liberia is the tiny little piece on the western coastline um, at, uh, near, the, near the top as well. All the rest have been taken over by other territories. You can see the different colors representing the different nations that control those areas. This, of course, is um, another uh, cartoon showing you The World's Plunderers by Thomas Nast, 1885. This is after the conference was over and basically showing all these different nations grabbing territory. Germany grab bag, British grab bag, Russian grab bag, of course, there were others too, all grasping at territories and putting them in their bags. The British Empire in Africa. Britain prided itself on being what they thought was the most enlightened of the imperialist powers, though its rule can still be considered very oppressive in these nations. It took control of Egypt in 1883. The Sudan after taking control over Egypt, Britain pushed southward to the Sudan, which is where they will have more difficulty. It resulted in the Battle of Omdurman in 1898, where General Horatio H. Kitchener defeated the Sudanese tribesmen and killed 11,000 of them with machine guns, while only 28 Britons died. It was a massive slaughter. The Fashoda incident was also part of this, 1898. France and Britain nearly went to war over who would control the Sudan. France eventually backed down, partly because it was in the midst of the Dreyfus affair at home, and uh, the military, of course, was enwrapped in all of the Dreyfus affair as well. So they were, they backed down and allowed Great Britain to maintain control over the Sudan. South Africa and the Boer War is another area where we see Great Britain involved in imperialism, 1899 to 1902. And it starts with the man I mentioned before, Cecil Rhodes. He had ultimately taken a territory, this British businessman who had gone in, taken the territory um, in South Africa. And he had basically become, or declared himself, prime minister of what would be called Cape Colony in South Africa. He was the principal sponsor of the Cape to Cairo dream, where Britain would dominate the African continent. And if you look at the picture, the third one down on the left, you see a man standing across astride the uh, African continent. That's supposed to be Rhodes and, of course, controlling the area, um, just representing that. Diamonds and gold were discovered in the Transvaal region and Rhodes wanted to extend his influence there. But the Boers controlled the region in South Africa. Now the Boers were these descendants of white Dutch settlers that had settled in that area of South Africa back in the 16th, 17th century when the um, Dutch basically were able to take over some of the areas that had once been controlled by Portugal. And these Dutch, the descendants of these Dutch settlers had been there now for a, a century and a half to two centuries. Cecil Rhodes, like I say, depicted here in this punch cartoon that I pointed out the third one down there. Um, here it is larger and reflecting the attitudes of the British imperialism. Rhodes' dream was the British control from Cape Town in um, the south to Cairo in the north in Egypt. And he's holding a string representing British control over the entire region. The geography of South Africa here. You see the British Cape Colony. The Orange Free State, of course, was an area that was controlled by the Boers. Transvaal region in green, Natal in red. The Boers, those Dutch descendants, initially repelled the British troops trying to take over the region of South Africa. 
Um, the Kruger Telegram, however, in 1902, was where Kaiser Wilhelm II, at the time now, Kaiser William II, from Germany, sent a telegram to the Boers, basically congratulating them on defeating the British invaders without the need of German assistance. Well, that just made Great Britain angrier because this made them feel as if Germany was egging on the Boers, ultimately, so they could come in and maybe have influence in that region. And of course, this angered Great Britain, um, so they will fight even more harshly to gain control over this region. A massive British force will eventually be sent down, and they will defeat the Boers. Um, and in 1910, the Transvaal region, the Orange Free State, Cape Colony, and Natal combine to form what will be known as the Union of South Africa, controlled by Great Britain. By 1890, Britain controlled Nigeria as well, Kenya, Uganda, and Zanzibar. Germany had to recognize the British control of these regions in return for British recognition of German control of an island naval station in the North Sea. The French Empire in Africa, what territories did they take in Africa? First of all, Algeria. Since 1830, the French had controlled Algeria in North Africa. The attack on French shipping by Barbary pirates was used as a pretext for this conquest. Algeria remained under French control until the early 1960s. Although the Algerians periodically conducted viable uprisings in the 19th century and after World War II, the French will maintain control until the early 1960s. Tunisia is another French territory in Africa. In 1881, France justified its annexation of Tunisia due to frequent raids into Algeria by the Tunisian rebels. So they decided to take over Tunisia as well. Tunisia will become a French protectorate. Y'all remember, a protectorate basically is a nation claiming control over that region. They're not protecting them from anything. Uh, Britain abandoned its claims to Tunisia at the Berlin Conference in 1884-85, largely because they had to in order to avoid war, did not want another incident um, with the French. So again, this was how Bismarck played France and Britain off of each other um, at the Berlin Conference. French control of the Northern Congo Basin was also recognized at the Berlin Conference. Somaliland, modern-day Somalia, gave France territory on the East African coast. And Madagascar, an island off the coast of East Africa, was seized by France in 1896. France controlled West Africa, including the Ivory Coast and the Sahara region. Britain recognized these claims in return for French recognition of British control of Egypt and the Sudan. By 1914, France controlled most of Morocco as well. Now Germany. Since Germany wasn't unified until 1871, it was late to the imperialist game compared to Britain and France that had started seizing territories in the early 1800s. Prior to 1884, when the Berlin Conference met, Bismarck had not really been very interested in colonialism, as he was more concerned about dangers posed by Russia to his east and France to his west. However, that will change. The Berlin Conference was organized by Bismarck and Jules Ferry from France to provide for a more orderly conquest of Africa. This guaranteed that Germany would now be a major player in Africa when the time was right. Bismarck was convinced by 1884 that Germany must get involved in this in order to remain um, a, an up-and-coming nation on the world stage. And, and they definitely would be, as we know, entering World War I. Germany thus set about establishing a number of small protectorates in Africa for themselves. By World War I, Germany controlled territory in Africa 
five times larger than Germany itself, than the land in Germany itself. In 1884, Germany took control over Cameroon and Togoland in West Africa. In 1885, Germany formally claimed Tanganyika, which was renamed German East Africa. This was easily done since German businessmen had already dominated the region. Southwest Africa, or Namibia, Namibia sorry, also came under German control. German control was particularly brutal as a local rebellion resulted in Germans killing over 50,000 men, women, and children to take control over Namibia. Key concept. Italy. Italy was the last of the European powers to participate in the scramble for Africa. Eritrea on the Red Sea coast became Italy's first colony in Africa in the 1880s. In 1896, Italian forces were defeated while trying to take Ethiopia, however. Italy became the first European country to suffer a defeat by the Africans. And of course, that would be an extreme embarrassment for the European nation to be defeated by the, um, by the African peoples. And this, of course, racism uh, is all part of that as well. And this will make Italy feel as if they have something to prove going into World War I and, of course, eventually going into World War II. 6,000 Italian troops were killed um, in their attempt to take over Ethiopia, and thousands were taken prisoner by the Ethiopians. Mussolini, later, after... Um, World War I is over when Mussolini takes over Italy. He will seek to rectify this humiliating defeat by finally conquering Ethiopia in 1935. Libya was taken from the Ottoman Empire by Italy in 1912 as well. Portugal controlled Angola in Southwest Africa and forced the people there to accept what amounted to slavery. Even though slavery had been outlawed by the Berlin Conference, it really was still slavery in Angola. Again, here is colonial Africa in 1914, showing you once again what territories belonged to whom in the scramble for Africa. New imperialism in Asia. We're going to start in China. Okay, so it really does begin with a series of wars between Great Britain and China over the opium trade. Ultimately, this was the background for this. China had come up with a policy that there were only certain ports that they would be open to doing trade with Western nations. And those ports also, the, the, the Western nations like Great Britain and others, to do trade in these ports, they had to have special documentation. Um, they also could only trade with certain sanctioned um, traders in those regions, Chinese traders in those regions. And they had to trade only by paying the Chinese in silver for the goods that they wanted to get from the Chinese, rather than trading some other uh, British good or European good for those things. They the Chinese emperor had decided that they did not want any British goods. They instead wanted just silver, silver bullion. Now, this made it very expensive to do trade with China, to get the goods from China that the British wanted, like tea and silk and those kinds of things. So the British decided, okay, this is what we're going to do. British had control over India, and in India and, and the Pakistani region to the north of India, uh, they grew poppies, and poppies, of course, are the source of opium. They would take this opium from um, India and the Pakistan region, and they would smuggle it into China, selling it on the black market in China, getting, of course, silver in return for the opium that they were selling to the Chinese. Now they had silver from the Chinese, that they would then use to buy the 
goods that they wanted in the official uh, markets that they were allowed to trade in. So they were doing an illegal trade in opium to get the silver that the Chinese said that they, the Chinese emperor said that he would only accept from uh, British traders. And they would use that silver that they just got on the black market from the Chinese by smuggling in opium to them, getting them hooked on this drug. And then they had to have more of it. So now that silver was Chinese silver that they're now trading back to get Chinese goods. Uh, so ultimately, China was making no profit on this. And instead, many Chinese were getting hooked on this terrible drug and were dying as a result of it. So this, this is the increasing British trade of opium in China in the mid-19th century that took a large toll on the Chinese people that's mentioned here. The Chinese government demanded that the British stop selling the illegal drug of opium in China. A series of wars. The first opium war happens in 1839, 18 through 1841. Britain occupied several coastal cities and forced China ultimately to surrender. The Chinese could not um, compete with the British naval forces. It resulted in the Treaty of Nanjing, 1842. The Treaty of Nanjing gave Hong Kong to Britain and it remained a British colony until 1997 when it went back to China. They also received four treaty ports. They were open for British trade, including Canton and Shanghai. These were previous areas that were not open to British trade. British residents living in China, as well as other European visitors, were also with this treaty granted extraterritoriality and were thus immune from Chinese law. This means that any European could do whatever they wanted, even if it would be against the law in China, they could not be prosecuted for it. This treaty was very unfair to China, obviously, but since they lost the war, the British were the ones calling the shots. So this basically, this extraterritoriality basically was diplomatic immunity being given to any European trader in China very unfair. Sometimes these are, this is the beginning of what they're called the unequal treaties for China. The second opium war happened between 1856 and 1860, and once again, the Chinese lost. Uh, China was forced to open six more ports to both British and French trade indefinitely as a result of this. Uh, this is why they're called the unequal treaties. It's all to benefit the Europeans and nothing benefits the Chinese at all. Uh, Chinese, China was forced to accept trade and investment on unfavorable terms for the foreseeable future as well. And this is why we say that China lost its sovereignty uh, during the age of new imperialism. Uh, and instead, the European nations carved out spheres of influence throughout China for themselves. Taiping Rebellion of 1850 was also something that happened. Uh, this was primarily caused by differing Chinese factions, rebels that were opposed to the uh, Chinese government under the Manchus was part of it. Uh, the Manchus defeated the rebellion, but it took them 14 years to do so with the help of the British military. And so therefore the British felt that they really had a say in this region and that's why when the second opium war happened they're like hey we just helped you out with your rebellion um so why the heck are you um making us fight you once again we're gonna make you pay for that that's why the unfavorable terms for china in the taiping rebellion 20 million chinese died so as i said we call these areas spheres of influence. By the late 19th century, much, much of Eastern China had become subject to the domination um, of the British, the French, the Russians, the Japanese, and the Germans. All of them had taken their own spheres of influence in China. Even though they may not control it politically, they control almost all of, of China, Eastern China, 
um, economically. So this is an economic kind of imperialism. Japan gained Taiwan as a result of the Sino-Japanese War. Britain gained a trade monopoly for the Yanks on the Yangtze River. France gained a lease on Canton Bay and a sphere of influence and trade in several southern provinces. Russia controlled northern Manchuria, seeking to build a railroad through the region. Germany gained a 99-year lease on the port of Qingdao and concessions to build two railroad lines Shandong, in the Shandong province. This is another political cartoon that is often seen when studying new imperialism. It's called China, the Cake of Kings and of Emperors. 1898. And you see what represents China is the man in the background basically holding his hands up going, stop! And you see representations of all those other European nations as well as Japan. You have Japan on the far right. You have France, the Marianne in the background there, looking over the shoulder of the Russian, uh, representing representation of the Russian with, of course, the German in the center there with his knife looking menacingly at um, Great Britain, which is represented by somebody who looks like Queen Victoria. Okay, and of course, China is labeled as the cake at the bottom that's being carved up by, the, by these nations. Here's the Chinese Empire in 1910. What was controlled by whom? Economically, if not politically. But in reality, because they controlled the, the these Europeans and the Japanese controlled these areas economically, ultimately China did not really have a whole lot of their own sovereignty any longer. The U.S. also got in on the game by demanding an open door policy to trade in China, resulting in an agreement that the imperialist powers in China would not interfere in any treaty port or the interests of another power. This was a way that the uh, United States got in on the game here. They did not want to be kept out of economic interests in the region. So by saying, let's all have an open door policy, it meant that, that, that uh, nobody um, you know, could interfere with any other non-Chinese nation moving in and doing business in this area. In China, by 1900, we had another rebellion going on. First, remember, it was the Taiping Rebellion in the 1850s. Now, the Boxer Rebellion in 1900. This was led by a Chinese secret society of nationalists. They were called the Society of the Righteous and Harmonious Fists. This is why it's been nicknamed the Boxers. They were the Boxers, like, you know, fists, Boxers. Um, the Boxer Rebellion. And this was a rebellion in northern China that ultimately targeted European officials, killing them, and sought to force out the Western and Japanese influences in China. They were basically a Chinese nationalist group. They're trying to exile the foreign powers from their control, their economic imperialism in China. A multinational army would be formed by the European nations and Japan ultimately to put down the Boxer Rebellion because, of course, those Westerners and Japan did not want to lose their interests in the region to this rebellion. So this multinational army included Great Britain, France, Japan, the United States, Germany, and Russia, all sending men in to crush the Boxer Rebellion, to crush the uprising, um, and foreign domination of China continued until the birth of the Chinese Republic in 1911. Here is a picture of the boxers, those nationalist, Chinese nationalist rebels. Here, of course, is that a picture of a multinational force to put down the Boxer Rebellion from the left, Britain, the U.S., Australia, which was controlled by the British, British India next, Germany, France, Austria, Hungary even was involved, Italy, and of course, Japan. In 1911, the Manchu dynasty 
um, was finally overthrown and replaced by a republic in China, led by a nationalist, Dr. Sun Yat-sen. Now, what about India? India, of course, would be seen as the jewel of the British Empire. The Mughal Empire that was controlled by Muslims fell apart in the 17th century. After the Seven Years' War that we talked about several units ago, the British East India Company was given control of India and was directly accountable to Parliament for the management of India. Robert Clive captured military posts in Madras and England ousted France from India during the Seven Years' War, during the British victory in the Seven Years' War. Remember that Seven Years' War took place on many continents, including India. The British East India Company took the last native state in India by 1848. British India in red or pink. In 1857 to 58, there was a mutiny, however, called the Sepoy Mutiny. It was an insurrection of Hindu and Muslim soldiers that were uh, incorporated into the British Army. They were Indians that were incorporated into the British um, forces in India to maintain British control over India. Uh, ultimately, this insurrection happened. Um, it spread throughout northern and central India before it was crushed, is primarily by loyal native troops from southern India. The sepoys ultimately were uh, rebelling against the British authorities that they had been working for in the, you know, British Indian military. Uh, the sepoys resented the British taking direct control of Indian states. They also were reacting against the fact that the um, the short-term cause, I guess I should say, was that the British used animal fat to grease the rifle cartridges. Um, and um, the animal fat, of course, they had both uh, pork fat and beef fat being used to grease these new rifle cartridges because, remember, industrialized weapons now. Um, both the Muslims and Hindu faiths saw this as sacrilege. Of course, the Muslims um, believe that pork is unclean. And of course, the Hindu believe that it believed that the, um, the beef, you know, that cows were sacred. So neither of them believed that they could touch these cartridges. And they were, of course, being forced to by the British as part of their job as the uh, Sepo in the Sepoy army. And so they rebelled against this, basically this uncaring, you know, it's like they, the British don't have any idea or care to know um, the cultural traditions of the people. And it just was basically came to a head, if you will. That was like the straw that broke the camel's back. Really, they didn't want the British taking direct control over Indian states, but this was the last straw. It was sort of like the, the catalyst that set the whole uh, mutiny in motion with the, the rifle cartridges, the grease on the rifle cartridges that they were being forced to handle. Uh, the result, of course, was after 1858, when the Sepoy Mutiny was put down by the British, after 1858, India was ruled by the British Parliament in London directly rather than indirectly, and they admin um, administered by a tiny all-white civil service in India. In other words, instead of the British East India Company having um, control over the region, the British government took control outright over the region, and instead of allowing there to be any kind of self-government, basically an all-white civil service was sent to India to maintain control over the colony. British reforms in India. A modern system of progressive secondary education was put in place. This was mostly done to train some of the Indian civil servants um, uh, that would be utilized uh, as in smaller government positions, uh, lower government positions throughout the region. Ultimately, this will be something that will, it depends on how you look at it. Some would look at it as a benefit for, um, for the Indian population, um, giving them this, you know, progressive secondary education. But in reality, it was done 
by the British not to serve the Indians, but to serve their needs for eventually having to have more and more um, locals to buy in to the British maintaining control over the region. Um, there was some economic development that happened uh, with the British having control of India as well. Irrigation projects were put in place. Railroads, um, about 25,000 miles were built throughout India by 1900. And India's cotton industry became the fourth largest in the world. That's why those irrigation projects were so important. The tea trade was also a big part of this and development of the jute plantations. Jute was used to make rope. Britain created a, uh, a unified and powerful Indian state for themselves, however. The Indian National Congress would be formed in 1885. The purpose was Britain trained Indians should be running India along the British lines. So the British allowed for the Indian National Congress to form handpicking themselves the Indian the Indians in the population that they would then educate in the British system and then have them govern in the name of Britain along British lines for the benefit of Britain ultimately. Um, there were a great number of educated Indians, predominantly Hindu ones, but however increasingly started to demand more and more equality and self-government rather than just being dictated what to do by the British. Due to the INC's leadership in the independence movement, led by eventually Mohandas Gandhi and Jawaharlal Nehru, India will eventually gain its independence, but not until 1947, after World War II. But the Indian National Congress that was formed in 1885 will be a major player in why India will achieve its independence after World War II. We'll talk more about that when we get to that later lecture. Other British colonies in Asia, Burma in the 1820s, the Malay Peninsula in Malaysia, North Borneo in Indonesia, France, of course, had Indochina, which is called French Indochina, which is modern day Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos. Um, Indochina became a protectorate of France in the 1880s and 1890s. And France also in the South Seas took Tahiti and New Caledonia. That's one of the reasons why Gauguin was in Tahiti painting the Tahitian women that we saw in the last um, unit with the realism and with um, the new movements in art. Germany took control over the Marshall Islands and Samoa in the South Pacific. And in the Spanish-American War in 1898, the U.S. defeated Spain and took the Philippines from Spain, also taking Guam and Hawaii. So the U.S. was just as involved in this uh, imperialism that was going on in the late 19th century. Japan was the exception among Asian nations regarding Western imperialism. Remember, they were involved in taking territories as, as well, especially places like China. So how did that happen? The U.S. had forced Japan to open trade in 1853. And unlike China, Japan quickly modernized. Rather than trying to fight against westernization, they decided that they would adopt western ways and become an imperial power themselves by the late 19th century. Japan was the only major Asian power to resist being swallowed up by the European imperialists by basically becoming more like them. Now, some purist Japanese would say that they sold their souls by doing this. That they, by becoming more like the West to compete with the West, they lost their traditional cultural ways, but they maintained themselves as independent as a result of doing it. The Meiji Restoration in 1867 was one of the reasons why this happened at this time. Um, this resulted in a series of reforms to compete with the West. Ultimately, with the Meiji Restoration, it ended the shogunate period um, in Japan, put control back in the hands of the emperor, the Meiji emperor, 
And um, the Meiji emperor was very much, he had been educated in the Western style. He was very interested in the Western ways. And so he fostered along this idea of Westernization for Japan, recognizing that Japan would never be able to compete with the West the way they were, that they would have to modernize and Westernize and industrialize in order to compete with the West. This is why Japan will be able to fight a war against Russia in 1904-1905 for control over Asian territories, um, that Russo-Japanese war. They will be able to fight and defeat Russia because they had modernized faster than, of course, Russia had been kind of stuck in low gear with modernization. Here it is, the Russia-Japanese War starting 1904. Russia and Japan both had designs on Manchuria and Korea. The Japanese were concerned about the Russian Trans-Siberian Railway that had crisscrossed across Manchuria. Japan decided that they would attack Russia and they destroyed the Russian fleet off the coast of Korea and won major battles on land, although Russians turned the, th the tide on land subsequently. The Westerners were horrified that Japan had defeated a major Western power, and they recognized that Japan now would be um, a country that they would have to deal with um, moving forward into the 20th century. Here is a political cartoon regarding the Russo-Japanese War. The bear represents Russia. Uh, the bear, I've struck a hornet's nest now for sure. Of course, J Japan was the hornet's nest, and that was true. This cartoon is particularly pat because of the great reliance which Japan placed on her torpedo flotillas, boats of that type being called the hornets of the navy. Her military tactics by sea and land were of the swift and stinging order, it says. The Treaty of Portsmouth, which was um, mediated by the U.S. President Theodore Roosevelt, ended the war, the Russo-Japanese War, with Japan winning major concessions in Asia. The long-term impact of the war, Russia turned to the Balkans to try to gain territories instead of concentrating on Asia. The Russian Revolution, the first one in 1905, the second one in 1917, would eventually also be, um, you know, an impact of this war. And Japan eventually will annex Korea, taking it for itself too. Asian revolts in the 20th century will happen as a result as well. Asians hope to emulate Japanese power and win their independence against the Westerners. So there will be constant rebellions in the Asian nations that were controlled by uh, Westerners um, throughout the last, you know, half of the 20th century, early, sorry, last half of the 19th century, early 20th century. Key concept. Now there are also opponents of imperialism. Karl Marx himself was actually an opponent of imperialism. He wrote, I guess you would say, a second earth-shattering book, uh, Das Kapital, in 1867. Some would say it's Communist Manifesto Part II, uh, where he explains his problems with imperialism. He claimed that the bourgeoisie needed constant expanding of their markets to increase their profits, and this would inevitably lead to world conquest, Western nations uh, conquering territories because of business. These businessmen ultimately were uh, controlling, you know, these, these foreign takeovers. J.A. Hobson was another one who was probably the most prominent of the anti-imperialist theorists. He stated that imperialist powers needed colonies in order to provide new markets for domestic European goods, but that was not panning out as well as they had hoped. He claimed that businessmen and bankers unduly influenced the government's imperialist policies. He wasn't wrong. He was absolutely right. The people who were voting were the businessmen, and the businessmen were voting for politicians who were pro-imperialism because it would benefit them in the long run, the businessmen in the long run. Thus, imperialism benefited only the wealthy, Hobson claimed. 
He believed that if European governments forced businesses to raise wages for workers, this would result in increased consumption of goods at home and less of a need for new markets abroad. So he was arguing that if they actually paid workers at home more, that those workers at home would be buying the goods that they're manufacturing, and there would be less of a need to find new markets to buy the European goods. Anti-imperialism increased in Europe as a result of Hobson's work and the work of others. Socialists accepted Hobson's link between capitalism and imperialism. Many argued that imperialism was just one more um, branch of capitalism and um, capitalism that goes, uh, you know, unabated ultimately would lead to war. V.I. Lenin is one of those people. Of course, Vladimir Lenin of Russia was a Marxist. He saw imperialism as leading to colonial rivalries between nations, and eventually those rivalries will end up in war. And of course, this was the case in World War I. So Lenin had basically said, imperialism will eventually lead to wars between the nations over those spheres of influence. And those little wars will eventually, um, you know, grow to be a massive world war, which it did. Here's the new imperialism review, territories that were gained by different nations in Africa and in Asia.